Welcome to Ability Fierce. I'm Michael Astor, and today our guest is Jeremy Demick from Disability Rights New York. And he's going to tell us about Disability Rights New York, what they do, and about Access VR, which is a program that was founded after World War I to help disabled veterans find work. And it's also a good tool if you have a disabled kid who wants to go to college. And we're going to talk about some of the problems, some of the benefits, all that stuff. Hey, Jeremy, how are you hey, doing? Hey, Michael. Good thank to, you. Good to see you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Um, um, go ahead. How did you get started with Disability Rights New York? It was, um, so I, a friend of mine told me about the position I, up in Albany. Mm -hmm. So I interviewed back in October 2015 for, it's a position known as a Client Assistance Program Advocate mm -hmm. or CAP Advocate. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they liked me in the interview and they said, hey, come on on board. And I started in November 2015 and I've been with them ever since. Okay, now Disability Rights New York gets funding from the state or the federal government to sort of check that all the things are working. It's sort of like a ombudsman -y kind of role or something like that. Yeah, that's kind a of bit? a way to describe it. I, mm -hmm. the, um, all of our programs are federally funded. Mm -hmm. They're federally funded grant programs mm -hmm. and they're through a system that's called the Protection and Advocacy or PNA. Mm -hmm. and p and kind of sounds like an old time grocery store, but it's um, the protection advocacy system, it started in the 70s, mm -hmm. um, you know, with the, you know, the uncovering of all the terrible things that were happening on Staten Island and the Willowbrook Institute mm -hmm. and School. Mm -hmm. And Congress said, you know, we've had enough of this. Mm -hmm. um, so they started from there. It started with a, a program called PAD. It was a protection advocacy for individuals with developmental disabilities. Mm -hmm. And that that program um, over time throughout the 80s and 90s incorporated a lot of more, um, I guess for lack of better words, the categories of individuals with disabilities. Like um, in 1986, they brought on Congress authorized a program known as PAMI, which is Protection and Advocacy for Individuals with Mental Illness. And it just grew from there and there's, it now covers all individuals with disabilities. Um, and we do things like monitoring, um, we make sure that People are being um, mistreated either by neglect or abuse. Mm -hmm. And there's what's unique about Disability Rights New York is that we've, as an agency, been authorized as the state's protection advocacy agency mm -hmm. in 2013. And um, my program that I work in is a little different. Mm -hmm. And it, it's um, the client assistance program is not technically a, a PNA or protection advocacy program. Mm -hmm. But we work with individuals so that they can be treated fairly as they're going through the VR or Access VR system or working with the Commission for the Blind. Mm -hmm. um, some people may know Access VR as VESID. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the old name. Yeah. yeah, that was the old name that everyone remembers. And further back, it was called OVR, but I don't hear anyone say that. That's like way back in the 50s and the 60s. And, um, you know, our, our mission is really to be on the side of the client. That's, you know, we're there to answer questions. We're there to advocate for them. Um, we're there to negotiate with Access VR and, you know, just do a lot of things so that things go smoothly or as smoothly as possible. Okay. Now, I sort of attack things on a larger level than the, you know, there's the, you can go through the bureaucracy or you can sort of stand outside and, and throw rocks, and that's kind of my role. Um, You're a rock thrower? Yeah. Uh, so why, you know, you have these programs. Why do you need something like Disability Rights New York? Shouldn't these programs be working so well that this, the, that function would be irrelevant? Um, we could hope for that in an ideal society. But, mm -hmm. you know, it, as we've seen, even when we pass laws, whether they're for disability, uh, protection of individuals with disabilities and those rights, we see those rights infringed upon either through, um, sometimes it's not out of malice, but sometimes it's out of ignorance and not knowing that, you know, you're, you could provide, for example, like your employee, a reasonable accommodation before just throwing them out the door and terminating them. What I'm saying is that, yeah, sometimes it's malice and sometimes, but I find in the whole system, there's so much ignorance of the system. Like, uh, with my experiences with Access VR, 
very, they ended up helping pay for Nick's live-in AIDS room and board. Mm -hmm. But they didn't tell me that was something they could do. They said, all we could do is pay for the books and the tuition. And with the Excalibur grant in New York State, the tuition becomes irrelevant. So I said, right. can we kick some of the money for tuition to, to room and board? Uh, because I don't know if a lot of people realize it, but the Excalibur grant only covers about $6,000 of tuition, and the room and board is substantially more. And mm -hmm. with Nick, he needs a living aid, so we're being charged for another room. You know what I mean? It would have been nice to know going into it that there was more uh, money available. It would have given us a little more flexibility. So have you noticed this, that they're not always telling you, um, telling the clients or whatever, the, the people, everything that they can offer? Definitely. It's, um, you know, I just want to say, like, my exposure to this system and working with it over the years, mm -hmm. it's, you know, your experience going through this, there's good people that become voc rehab counselors. Like, I, I did it not because I wanted to mm -hmm. um, stop people from achieving things. You know, I did it like a lot of other people because they care about individuals and they want to see, you know, they want to work in something where it's fulfilling and they're helping people, um, it, whether it's with college or whether it's with college and then reaching an employment goal. Mm -hmm. um, but what happens is there's different takes, like you're going to get a different experience if you work with a different counselor. But I think that's why um, the program that I'm in, the, the client assistance program, mm -hmm. or also known as CAP, that's why we're there kind of as a check and balance because you can approach this system and there's complexity to it and it can be opaque. Mm -hmm. um, even when Access VR explains it to um, a client or the client and their family when they're in an orientation about all services, that orientation, you may not run into a problem until a year and a half or two years later. And that mm -hmm. orientation, your memory of that has faded a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, we do this work every day and we get, you know, accustomed to working things out, finding solutions. And, you know, it's not all like I would say that some of our work were we're rooted in terms of like the client is in our corner. That's mm -hmm. where it comes. You know, that's our our sort of directive our prime directive that, you know, we're there for them. Mm -hmm. And but there's counselors that I've worked with where you can work something out like a misunderstanding between client and counselor and collaborate together like hey you know like John needs this and here's some evidence mm -hmm. as why to, he needs like an adaptive program on his computer to succeed mm -hmm. is one example mm -hmm. and the counselor they have that aha moment or that epiphany they agree with you mm -hmm. and then you could work with them um, I've had counselors bring cap clients in they want us in on a meeting because they're like i want you in on this next meeting so that we can talk things out and we could collaborate because mm -hmm. the dynamic is better in there um for clients you know clients might not feel like they're going it alone to step into a room with the counselor mm -hmm. and uh, so what are some of your biggest accomplishments on the job um some of the bis biggest accomplishments on the job um recently I got um, someone approved for a vehicle modification. Mm -hmm. This was a lengthy process and it um, started actually when I was working in the Albany DRNY office. Now I've transferred down to Brooklyn. So it's been about a one and a half year process in terms of this getting- to, And this is one and a half years that this person can't drive their car? Yeah, yeah. You see, that's what's, that's what's bothering me, right? That's where I, I, I go and I say, there seems to be this pervasive attitude. This thing takes a long time. You have to be patient. And people's lives are progressing. You know what I mean? It, it, and it, there's an actual, there's actual harm in, in not being able to. I, I mean, if you weren't entitled to it, okay, that would be bad too. Mm -hmm. But because you're entitled to it, but it's such a complicated uh, dance to get it, and it takes so long, there's there, nobody's looking at that impact. I don't think. Yeah, it's it's a system, I mean, where some of it is how they procure services that it's rooted in a very, it's 
they get stuck easily on things like paperwork needs to go from a district office to the Albany office and needs to be approved. Um, but some of those bigger purchases are also controlled by the state comptroller that you can't just like a district office or a counselor can't say, all right, I approve this, you know, here's your $125,000 for vehicle modification. Mm -hmm. Also, they have to do... That's what it costs? That's what this particular um, vehicle modification costs. Okay, we're talking big numbers here, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and you could buy several cars for that price. Yeah, well, this was very specific. It was mm -hmm. high-tech um, equipment that was going into a van, and um, that's... And some of it is the evaluation part, too. You need to get someone to come and do an adaptive driving evaluation. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of players involved in this and it's, it moves incremental sometimes because that service provider needs to do the evaluation, either like that adaptive driver evaluation or the um, assistive technology evaluation. If we're talking about like going to school and getting a computer or software or assistive devices, that report, whatever they produce has to get to Access VR before they can say, okay, we can justify this. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of it is how things are structured so that you have to justify these purchases. They can't move quicker because it's been set already as a system is this is how we procure things. Well, they can move quicker. The thing is, it's a question of priorities and stuff. I mean, it, 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 I know people are backed up, people are underpaid, pe people are confused about stuff, but I, I, I think that we have to... Can you see a way to make the system more efficient? I mean, with your experience, has, it, has um, anything revealed itself to you that you're like, why are we always doing this? We could just, they could do it this way. And In some ways, like, um, I think that the caseloads for counselors, like when you start talking like two or 300 people per counselor and then coordinating all the services and that, I think that a more reasonable way to look at it would be to hire more counselors so that you have one counselor maybe to 100 people that you're coordinating services with. What's the current load? Um, the current loads, you know, they vary from office to office, but, you know, I've heard downstate offices like here in the city and on Long Island and um, Westchester, like 200, 200 plus. It's hard to keep track of that many people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so basically underfunded, underpaid is the big problem. Yeah, there's a lot of good counselors out there in these agencies that are just stretched. They're like moving in 360 directions and it can be daunting to take on as, um, you know, to go it alone. Um, but it's, I always think that it's gonna be a learning process because these, you know, there's different agencies that don't necessarily talk to each other. They just sort of do, or they, they know they exist, but they're working in one building you know, they're in OPWDD and Access VR is doing their own thing. And mm -hmm. Access VR is completely stretched out in terms of what they do. Um, but I'm a fan of multi-systems approaches. You know, some of the stuff you, you know, you can kind of, you have to pick up over time. I mean, you have to learn things like, okay, here's Access VR, here's the Commission for the Blind but then also know things about, say, Social Security. Like, mm -hmm. how will work affect my benefits if I'm a person with dis a disability? And then your goal, like the overall arching goal here to improve the services and connect people to th these things, it makes sense. It's, um, it's, you know, there's, I don't know if I have an answer that could be encapsulated mm -hmm. into fixing all these multiple systems that we work within, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, reach out to the resources is, you know, what I say, don't go it alone. Don't, you don't have to go it alone and try and figure this all out on your own. There's, um, you know, there's real power in groups mm -hmm. that, you know, there's, there's an, a saying that if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. So that's where I really see, you know, that's why, you know, we do a lot of outreach to other groups. We like to partner together to try and change the broader, this macro level that you're looking at. Like, mm -hmm. how do you change all systems together? Mm -hmm. You work in a larger group together because ultimately, you know, as one human being, as one dad advocating for his son, mm -hmm. 
there's only so many hours in the day in the week that you can do and you still got to sleep and hopefully you, you know hopefully sleep and eat and, and work and work yeah. and that's it's no because it became a full-time job for me getting Nick into college like yeah. if i wasn't unemployed and i was i had a project that was totally trashed by the effort but i won i got him in and it's great and it's great for him mm -hmm. um you know but the other thing is it's great for the people who work with him and get to know him he's having a really good uh college experience and i'm very proud and very happy about that the fact that i'm broke and uh sort of having to become an advocate is not uh great but that's what what it what it worked out to but it just seems to me at every step of the way that it could have been done and should have been done more simply. I, I, let me just put this out there. Do you think it's intentionally designed so they save money, the less services they're providing, it costs less? So the inefficiencies are um, by design or by sort of neglect design? That's a good question. I mean, um, I, don't, I don't believe that it's set up at least, um, I guess I could speak most fluently about the folk rehab system. I don't believe that that was set up ill-intended to be like, oh, we'll devise this diabolical mm -hmm. plan to provide services and then we'll, you know, close the door on people and push them away. I don't, I don't mm -hmm. think that was the intent. Mm -hmm. I think that you had, a, you have a system across the country that in terms of voc rehab that has good intentions that, you know, people go into it because they want to help other people. Mm -hmm. There's one thing that I've noticed, this is kind of like, and, but I'm sorry, there's a lot of thoughts colliding together on this, but um, Americans as a tend, or what I've seen is if they think that someone is getting some other benefit that they're not getting and they're getting it as some kind of, un, if they believe it's unfair, mm -hmm. there's a, a greater scrutiny on that. Like, how dare you get food stamps? How mm -hmm. dare you get um, this money to go to college? You know, what if you're committing fraud? And mm -hmm. so these, I think that they made, these systems are set up with good intentions, mm -hmm. but they're also, there's this piece about, let's watch the money and make sure it's spent and justify how that's spent. And that's where I think that, this is my opinion, mm -hmm. that you know I'm not speaking for everyone in DRNY on this, but the, in terms of, um, you know, I think there's a sort of zealous or overzealous, maybe watchdog judiciary component to this. That, mm -hmm. And it's also about um, at levels of like state governments and federal governments, you know, how much do they put into the system? how much money goes in to provide these services. Yeah, I think we have to move away from the cost-based analysis. Um, a common issue that we get from students going to college is Access VR will go, all right, what do you want to do? Um, I want to become an, a teacher and work in New York State. Mm -hmm. And they'll go, okay, great, we support this. And so they're going along they're doing great, they're turning in their grades, they get to the fourth year, mm -hmm. they finish their bachelor's degree, and then they approach Access VR, or they do it in the senior year or junior year and approach Access VR, and Access VR goes, oh, wait a minute, we don't pay for grad school. Mm -hmm. so we often get some cases like that. So they don't pay for grad school. But they do. But they say, like there's this unwritten sort of old mindset mm -hmm. And with some counselors or some offices that they're like, no, we stop at a bachelor's and they have a policy within their college training policy on grad school, but it's under specific circumstances. Like the individual needs it for, because of their disability, they couldn't enter an entry level position in the field. Like if you're in the social work field, maybe you can't do that. The entry level of social work or it's human services, than, oh, right. you're going to do a lot of physical work. And if you can't, you know, run around and climb stairs and, mm -hmm. you know, check on people in brownstones and that are three floors up, mm -hmm. then you need that extra education. But it's also, you know, a call something like becoming 
a teacher, a social worker, a psychologist, um, mental health counselor, mm -hmm. those all require the, the requisite to get employment requires the master's degree. And that's what there's a disconnect still. Mm -hmm. There's an old, there's, I think so many officers or counselors are still caught in a mindset of like, you know, and this is what we did in 1989 and a bachelor's degree was great then. So we're going to keep going that way. Yeah. But this, but what I'm interested in focusing on is the real harm or the losses that people incur. Like if somebody was ready to go for the master's degree and mm -hmm. access VR could have in theory swung it for them, you know, whatever the money was available would have made it a reality. Right. And they couldn't swing it without that. They didn't, or they didn't know they had it. So they didn't go and realize their full potential, mm -hmm. even though that, money was technically available and they were technically entitled to it you see this that nobody's focusing on the harm that this has caused it's kind of like you take that as it's not going to get in the new york post i didn't get uh the master's degree money i was entitled to it's mm -hmm. not it's it's sort of but it's it it, it, it changes the course of someone's life in a very radical absolutely way. yeah and that's you know there's no perfect solution for that mm -hmm. um there's great counselors out there who get it mm -hmm. who say all right you know i'm i'm going to go the full course for someone in terms of like funding this education all the way mm -hmm. and you know we work with a lot of people who are on like public assistance or ssi ssdi and mm -hmm. they're not rolling in money they're not coming into the access VR office with a rolex on and being like help me out with mm -hmm. college mm -hmm. um so and what happens is the people who are successful at accessing the benefits are often the people who are wealthier and better educated you know what i mean that that if you are wealthier and you understand systems and you're not afraid to confront people and do some research and go around you're more likely to um, access these things and you're also more likely to be better off and the people who are poor and on public assistance are often not the kind of people who know how to manipulate the bureaucracy or investigate and stuff like that um so it, it's there's a lot in this um you know that there's different experiences that people are coming from there's mm -hmm. good counselors in the system there's you know ones that don't get it but you know what i'd say is don't settle um you know when you're told like you can't get funding for grad school check it out you know come to us and check mm -hmm. it out um, you know, there's, we'll see if we can look at it from another angle, maybe give another opinion. Mm -hmm. Um, one other important thing that I want to note about college, this is for anyone coming in, when you approach your access VR counselor, um, don't, this is a matter of like semantics mm -hmm. and maybe that was before the, um, don't ask them directly for college. Don't go in and say, you know, I heard you pay for college mm -hmm. because they'll make this assumption and they might take this tone of lecturing you. Well, no, you know, we're all about employment and not college and then dissuade you from going to college and saying, you know, we'll set you up with a job developer and they'll help you write a resume and do mock interviews and then neglect this idea of sending that client to college. And this is okay? Well, this is something that could happen. I'm warning of this. So it's, it's a matter of semantics. If you do a little career research, even if you're not totally certain, like mm -hmm. if you're a high school senior and ready to approach Access VR, I would say even if it's a tentative goal, mm -hmm. like if you say a tentative goal, like I want to become, um, like the example before, like a social worker, even if you're not 100% on that, mm -hmm. go with that because they that's want, at least... They want concrete yeah goals yeah they seem to be very like what do you want to do and then that and then it becomes they put the supports in or try to put the supports in for that goal. yeah yeah and that's it's really the way they the best way to work with access vr is to look at it as it's like a business negotiation <laughs> in some ways mm -hmm. that's um and the other piece would be to try and bring them an end goal that mm -hmm. they can line the services up to mm -hmm. so you come in you meet the counselor and you say you know i want to be a, a business manager and you know get my mba and that's what i want to do 
and then you have something to work with. But if you, same person, if you walk in and you say, you know, I want to get college, mm -hmm. you know, they're going to say no, or they might say no. They, mm -hmm. A good counselor may engage you in a conversation about, so tell me about that. What do you mean? And mm -hmm. really extrapolate like, okay, this is the end goal. And Okay, so they're sort of trained that they have to have those magic words that you have an end goal. And then if that in requires college, then they jump aboard. But if you're just saying, I want to go to college, I don't know what I want to major in. I don't have a career goal. I just want to further my education. Then you're going to be, it's not going to, work that's correct right. you know and the, another thing i would advise um, parents or students approaching access vr is don't say liberal arts that's like a a deal breaker right there for them because they can't really see or connect this idea of it being that concrete mm -hmm. goal at the end of it uh, if it ask that's what I, I was talking to an advocate the day before yesterday and she said you know ask mm -hmm. even if you and that is a good uh, good advice. Yeah. If you want, I, ask, because the worst they could do is say no. And get second opinions. Mm -hmm. You know, if you ask, ask, if you're going to access VR and asking them something and they say one thing, mm -hmm. you know, take it out. You know, take it out to the ILC or Independent Living Center. Mm -hmm. Ask. Mm -hmm. You know, take it to us to mm -hmm. bring it to DRNY. Ask. Mm -hmm. Because if you ask you know the more people you ask the more yes, information you have you shall receive yeah sometimes 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 okay jeremy i'm going to wrap it up thank all right you. it was a pleasure thank you it was a very likewise conversation so this was a really great conversation with jeremy demick from disability rights new york we learned a lot about access vr which is a powerful useful tool but a little stubborn and, and finicky to manipulate uh, manipulate maybe not but uh, but what's the word you like better? Uh, employ, use, navigate. Navigate. Navigate is yeah. good. So uh, I think this has been a really informative session. I think a lot of the people out there in TV land should listen to this because I don't think a lot of people are accessing uh, Access VR right. It's access and access. Um, and I think that knowing about Disability Rights New York is a powerful tool to get more of what you want or what you need. And I think this has been a really valuable episode of Ability Fierce. And thank you for watching Ability Fierce. I'm Michael Astor. Stay tuned. We'll hit you back soon.